Okay, ladies and gentlemen, 10 o'clock. Welcome back to Senior Design Seminar. And I guess welcome back to MSOE, since we had a, a nice little break there over the, the winter holiday. And welcome to the year 2021. It's got to be better than the last one. God. <laughs> um, so thanks for uh, coming today, all you seniors. We got, you know, 100 plus of you out there. So nice to see all of you. Um, today, uh, we have a very special guest, Dr. Kenneth Cole. He's a surfboard shaper who lives right here in Milwaukee. And he is the founder of Greenhouse Surfboards. Today, he's going to have a discussion about the design and manufacture of some eco-friendly longboards. And I've kind of known Ken a, a, a little bit some time now, maybe about a year and a half or so, and come to know him. And he's really passionate and embodies all the things about surf culture. He's like the local uh, surfing guru. So it's going to be nice to hear from him. Um, but before we dive in on his talk, I do want to give a little bit of more feedback, a little peel back the curtain a little bit more about why we're doing some of these seminars and where this seminar kind of fits <coughs> into your general education. So as I mentioned last time uh, we had a seminar, there's this whole accreditation project or this whole accreditation process for engineering schools uh, that require us to sort of discuss with you or evaluate your ability to think about cultural design, global design, et cetera. And those things that we previously talked about are the ABET outcomes. So if I'll just remind you that there are seven outcomes that we hope to instill in you in your engineering education as you um, move through and become uh, certified engineers, hopefully at the end of this year. Um, a lot of those pillars of the outcomes that we expect are easy to understand. Things like identify, formulate, solve complex engineering problems. So this is what you do in pretty much every single class that you take. But sort of what I'm responsible for and hope what I can expose you to is a little bit more related to bullet point number two, which are the expected outcomes from your education. Things like ability to apply engineering design to produce solutions that meet specified needs with consideration of public health, safety, and welfare, as well as global, cultural, social, environmental, and economic factors. If you remember last time, we had a discussion from Dr. Severe about engineers without borders and the work that he did in Guatemala, which has a very interesting global and cultural side to that sort of design. And the work that he was doing there was influenced by where he was, the supply chain limitations, some of the culture of the the location and sort of them being entrenched in the way that they had been previously drying their spices was a little bit hindering to what designs they could pursue, etc. But those are things that he had to sort of consider and overcome in his particular designs. Now today, I want to shift a little bit more towards the um, environmental side of engineering. And that's why I've chosen or asked Ken to come give a talk today, because I think he's got a real fiery passion for sort of having economic design and eco-friendly design and really considering how his designs will impact the environment when let's say the the surfboard collapses or you know it's left barren in some ocean somewhere and has to you know live with the fish in the future so this is an important consideration for design for all of you going forward and what is the end of life of your particular design and how can you design things or incorporate components that might sort of work well for decomposing or end of life in whatever way possible, right? So um, I like what Ken does because he's, you know, going to discuss a little bit about his eco-friendliness and why that's particularly important to him. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring in some slides here that Ken's going to talk about, and I'm actually going to run the slides. And I'll do a quick, a quick introduction here of, of Ken. Um, so uh, Dr. Ken Cole, is actually a, a licensed psychologist, um, <laughs> which is interesting, um, with Wheaton Franciscan Healthcare. Is that is that right, Ken? You're still yep. with Wheaton Franciscan? Yep. yep. Um, but like I said, more importantly, I've uh, I've come to know Ken as sort of like the local guru of Milwaukee surfing. <laughs> so uh, outside of his work as a psychologist, he's got like this fiery passion for for surfing, and he's brought surf culture to kind of like the waves of like Michigan, um, through a variety of mechanisms, you know, just introducing people to surf. But um, one of the mechanisms that I'm probably most interested in and what you guys are going to hear about today is his pursuit to sort of manufacture a surfboard from 100 percent natural materials. And um, you can see sort of a picture of him in his workshop there uh, with one of the surfboards that he's fabricated. 
Um, and if you're interested, and we're only going to sort of scratch the surface on some of the things that he's done, he's done. His Instagram page is actually really awesome. So if you want to follow him on, on Instagram and look at some of the pictures that of some of the surfboards that he's made, I really encourage you to do that. Um, also, the website that he has is, is very well put together and, and very nice. Um, so I'm going to try to get rid of this, this bar here at the bottom. doesn't seem like I can do that, but um, that's okay. Um, so I'll take this time then and introduce Ken and say thank you, Ken, for coming through. And I'll kind of let you go through a spiel here, introduce your surfboards, talk about your company, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Awesome. Students, um, if you want to interject with questions in the chat, please, I would encourage you to do so. Um, Ken, sorry about that. Go ahead. Yes. Dr. Hart, thank you for your time and for having me come in here. So yeah, um, I yeah. So if you look at that picture on the left hand side, that's not what I make surfboards in. Um, <laughs> my full time gig is doing therapy, and I just was running late to this uh, because I had a client at nine o'clock. So bear with me as I shift gears because I often look at um, this is my Superman mode. My Clark Kent mode has a suit and tie on, so I have those two those two competing interests. But um, my passion is is actually making surfboards. Um, and I fell in love with surfing uh, back in my internship, back in the mid-90s. And uh, from there, it never left me. After that, I uh, moved back to Chicago and then Milwaukee. And that's how I basically ended up here. But um, how it went from just a love of surfing to making boards I think in many ways goes back to um, what drives most of us, which is our connection to the environment. And I think you'd be naive to not think that um, there's more that we can do to kind of really, really protect it. So to that end, um, what I've chosen to do is find or try to create small ways to move away from a reliance upon EPS foam. And that's where um, I got to meet Kevin and also Dr. Severe as well. So. Some might think that surfing in the Great Lakes is an odd thing, and in some respects it really is. When we think of surfing, we think of L.A., we think of Hawaii, Malibu, um, but we don't think of Milwaukee. Uh, but if you go into the next slide, or one of the next slides, rather, Dr. Hart, um, go beyond that, please. Yes, this gentleman, Tom Blake. He is actually regarded as one of the premier figures in all of surfing. Um, there's several people. There's... Uh, there's Tom Blake and there's Duke, Duke Kahanamoku. And Duke is a Hawaiian uh, person who is most known with, uh, with, with, uh, with uh, surfing. So the story behind Tom Blake, which I'll condense really quickly, is uh, he was born in Milwaukee in 1902 and he was an avid swimmer. And sometime in the early teens in Detroit, he was at a movie theater and he saw this reel, this movie reel of Duke, who won the Olympic gold medal for swimming. And he, um, he, was, he was passionate about finding out more about this guy. And actually, Duke was there. So Duke Kanemoku said, yeah, come on out, whatever. And Tom Blake took him up. He didn't look him up on Instagram, didn't Google the guy. He basically hopped on a train and found his way out to L.A. There he became a stuntman. And then soon thereafter, moved out to Hawaii. And again, this is all before any of the resources we have to plan a safe trip. And here you have this white guy from Wisconsin going out to Hawaii, which at the time was very different than it is today. And he was not received well. But um, in many ways, Tom Blake was, was an engineer. And um, he wasn't trained as one. He just had this passion, he had this vision, and he found a way to make it happen. So he went to the museums and he asked if he could look at these boards and break them apart in essence and restore them, but also design them and really improve upon them. So the, the slide you have to the upper left is what he called the water sled. And back then, uh, the surfboards were like 150 pound boards made of koa. They were massive, 15 feet long. There was no fin. You had to steer with your back foot, right? Um, and it was a sport that mainly men did because men could more easily towed around 150 pound boards, right? So his design was to make a hollow surfboard. And that's what you see in the middle there. He designed that. And that's one of his classes that he taught. And he basically made these designs public. And he played a big role in surfing becoming something that was accessible to so many people. Um, and uh, the other inventions that he 
people say that he came up with was the windsurfer. There's, uh, there's images of him toying around with a uh, windsurfer. Uh, the fin is something that he put on a surfboard. Um, even life-saving devices he created. So again, he wasn't trained, but he had this vision and he just found a way to make these things happen. Um, and I do want to say, um, having worked with Dr. Hart and others, this is the first time that I've crossed paths with engineers. And it's been reassuring to kind of be, I guess, a watered down version of Tom Blake and have this wacky like concept that's really not wacky at all. But that these ideas can come from anyone, even a psychologist. Um, and I think ideally you all can recognize the gift that you have, which is access to these resources, but also a skill set that you're building upon. And in many ways, it's limitless what you can come up with. So that's just my plug out to MSOE. <laughs> well, thank uh, you for that. <laughs> no, no, definitely, definitely. Well, yeah, so when people think of surfing in, in Milwaukee, they think, oh, it's so weird, it's so odd. It's not. And the way that I view it is, in many ways, we are taking surfboards and, and surfing back home because uh, this is the birthplace of Tom Blake. And, and I think the more you learn about this gentleman, the more you'll be fascinated by him. So the thing about surfing, though, is it gives us all a chance to kind of profess our love of you know, nature and our love of the waters. But yet what we're doing contradicts that to no end. Um, each year there's 400,000 surfboards made. And if you multiply that by the past 20, 30 years, that's millions of boards that are in the water. And they're almost all entirely, I'd say 99.9% .9 on ballpark and that, are made of expanded polystyrene foam, which as you know, um, around the country, around the world rather, we're banning single-use foams all over the place, and rightfully so, because that board that you see there the core of that board will be there for generations. It'll never go away. And we're deciding to move away from that. So my thought was, well, I can't replace the foam yet, but I can sure as heck replace um, what we wrap the board with, which is fiberglass. I can replace the plastics and all the metals. So one of the things that I've worked on doing is at least taking a small step away from this reliance on these toxic products and said, well, what else can I do? And what I've come up with, and, and others have done this, but I tried to go a little bit more crude. Um, I wanted to kind of basically see what could I do with raw jute, with, uh, with wood that I was tossing out? What could I do with you know, resins that were kind of collecting on the floor? What could I do with palm leaf even? And all these boards that I've made, yes, they have the foam core, but everything else is made up of repurposed coffee bags, uh, repurposed woods, repurposed resins. So, and that's one of the boards right there. So for instance, if you look at that fin, uh, that fin is made up of repurposed wood, but also a coffee bag from your favorite coffee shop, Collectivo. <laughs> uh, so, and then that, and that tail block, what I've used there again is repurposed woods, but also palm leaf is in there as well, um, which is surprisingly strong, uh, but also light as well. Should we go through the process? Sure, yeah. So basically, when you look at uh, people that are shaping boards, even the larger companies, what they do is they buy what's called a blank. And a blank is like a template that's already got the rough shape of the board. And those probably, a rough longboard blank would be about nine to 10 feet long, two feet wide, three and a half inches thick, whatever. And just a really rough template. And that would probably cost about, 100 bucks, 125 bucks, let's say. And then you add on shipping from California, China, whatever it is, and that all adds to this environmentally toxic relationship that surfing has. Um, Plymouth, Wisconsin is home of Plymouth Foam. And there, what uh, me and this other gentleman that I share that bay with, we bought these massive slabs of foam. Um, for 500 bucks. And from that, we were able to get 20 surfboards out of it. And turn to the next slide. And what we do is we set up a jig and we use a hot wire foam cutter that we drag across that based on a template that, that we've each designed. Next. And then once that's done, we glue it together, we clamp it together, and we 
map out a template and those lines on the side are rail bands and that is used to basically give us kind of a rough guide of how we want that shape to flow. So we start off planing the sides and we work way up to the second line in, the third line in, and it really varies, but it just kind of keeps us on, on point. What I've begun to do though is, since I've made eight or nine of these now, I've kind of begun to trust the process, my process, and now I'm actually sculpting the boards without the rail bands, and so far it's worked out okay. Um, because once you get that basic shape, you pull that shape out, then you can always refine it and balance it out. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about the, the stringers here? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so the stringer, what I learned recently even, we have this belief that we have to have that stringer, and that stringer definitely adds strength. But what I learned recently is the reason why they began to add stringers was because when you were shaping, you would have the foam would bounce a little bit too much and it would throw the shaper off. And I've heard, rumor has it, that the stringer would stiffen up the board. It does add strength, but there's a school of thought that if you glass it strong enough, the difference is, is really minimal. But so, so yeah, so basically that is, uh, I think that's basswood stringer. And some folks use, you know, really thick stringers because um, it does add weight. But what I like about the stringer is it kind of gives me a center point that I can always count on, rely on. Yeah, it's good. It helps you, yeah, find the center. It gives stiffness to the board. Yeah. We do have a question here in the chat. He sure. says, uh, from David, he says, how does the weight and strength compare to an EPS fiberglass board of like some of the, some of the boards that you make? I think maybe we'll get there in the end if you want to yeah, wait, but I'll, otherwise we can I'll go now. Quickly, so the first board I think I showed you, um, was a, was a beast of a board because it had no stringer and it was, someone gave me a big slab of foam and I just went overboard. And that thing was extremely heavy, not as heavy as the Hawaiian boards. But these I think are comparable in, in, in weight. They might be a bit heavier. And the reason is I have a belief that in the fresh water we're less buoyant, right? So I offset that by making the boards a little bit thicker, but to balance that out, I thin out the nose and I have more weight in the middle. But, mm -hmm. you know, I've had a lot of folks ride my board. And the one that I ride a lot, um, my wave count has gone up significantly. So so it doesn't keep me from catching waves. Um, and it's not heavy to carry. So I'd say the last board was like 20 something pounds, which is pretty heavy. Uh -huh. The board I'm making now is a little bit lighter because I'm, I, I mean, I'm still learning as well. And I yeah. realize. I don't need to have all that girth. Yeah. There's some refinement to the design process, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> Something we talk about a lot in this class. So, okay, we'll keep going. So, yeah, so this is kind of what happens once you begin to kind of shape, um, like sand it down and shape it down. So what we do for that is we use a planer to make to really do like a rough cut. And then from that, we use like a sure form, uh, even, I mean, it's, if you look at the tools we use, it's really fun because it's basically some sandpaper glued on a slab of wood. So <laughs> one of the main tools we have is this long, probably four foot by six inch, you know, perfectly flat sheet. And we just run around the edges of that. So it's, you know, like perfectly true. And then from that wide piece of wood, you run that on the top of it to make sure that it's balanced so it's domed, domed like correctly as, 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 as well, because we don't have the benefit of a nice smooth template. Like we are literally hacking this out of that slab of foam. Mm -hmm. There's some like artistry to this, this craftsmanship, you know, it's, you learn by doing multiple times and you refine your technique and get better and better. And I think that's, you know, something that's particularly interesting about this particular process. You're not going off a template. It's kind of more by, by feel and by artistic design, which is, I think it's kind of a cool thing. So, so, so if I may, along those lines, one of the theories that I have and the approach that I like to take with my boards. Um, so before I began this venture, I did a survey of all the surfers around here, of which 0.2% responded. But <laughs> one of the questions was, uh, how important is design? How important is the aesthetic? How important is eco-friendly? And folks are honest. They're like, I don't care about eco-friendly. I don't care about how it looks. I just want it cheap and I want it light. Right, uh -huh. which I respect that immensely. My thought, however, is given the love that I have for surfing, given where I learned and given Lake Michigan, I'm of the mindset that um, 
form and function should work be- should 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 really match, right? And my motto has been that you know the board should look as beautiful as it feels to surf. Mm-hmm. So when you look at you know those shapes, I want those shapes to kind of really pull something from you. And I found that the more recent ones have gotten even more, I guess, progressive. And yeah. they're just as functional too, though. Anyway. Yeah, I liked on your website, I think you have a quote that says something like boards that embody the beauty of surfing. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think that idea, even though maybe only a handful of the people responded to you with, I just want it light and I want it cheap or whatever. I mean, there's so much to the surf culture about like you want your board to represent eco-friendliness and, right. and being one with nature. I think there's a lot to be said about understanding your audience in a way with your particular design. Um, so I think that's that's also rings true with what you're doing here. You know, if I may riff on that too, though, um, recently we were part of a we um, we were part of a project where we had to interview all, all um, like all these surfers and folks in folks in surfing industry. And one of the folks we interviewed basically said that she loved surfing. She she just loved it. But the thing she did not like is the separation that she felt. She felt that when she got on her board, this connection was always going to be only so strong. Mm-hmm. So I can relate to that too, uh, because when I surf here, it's great. But when I surf in, let's say, Hawaii, it's even better because I don't have neoprene that separated me from the environment. So if you were to, in essence, ride a surfboard that's made, let's say, of only leaves or only wood, and it was done well, and you're in Hawaii with just shorts on, in essence, you're you're kind of one with nature. Yeah. But if you go out there on a board made of formaldehyde, which they don't make with boards out of formaldehyde, but foam and all these toxic chemicals and you have this heavy neoprene suit and you say you love the environment, you're not going to have the same experience. So I think partly, Kevin, that's part of what drives me to do that because I don't want to have that separation. And I think other folks want to be have a stronger connection as well. Sure. There's a very cultural side to the design that you're pursuing, which I think is powerful. Yeah. Mm-hmm. OK, let's. Uh, yeah. Yep. Maybe continue with the process. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, Collectivo has a ton of coffee bags, and they throw them out. And every now and then, I'll grab some of them. <laughs> and Dr. Hart was very beneficial as well, and let me know that. Um, and I will slaughter what you said, but in essence, uh, this could in essence work and would be strong enough to really support a board. Um, and the type of pressure a surfboard is under, especially here. It's not Mavericks or any of these other spots. You know, I've had no delamination. I've had no dings. I've had none of that. With this board, what I did was beneath that is a layer of four ounce basalt. And the reason I did that was because other than that basalt, everything on this entire board that you're seeing now is jute or hemp. And I didn't want to gamble. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. said I want to play it safe and at least have a base on the deck where my butt would sit, where um, I would had that extra security. But in hindsight, that wasn't necessary. So, um, right. That- you, you, you want to just talk for a second about the relative strengths of these particular materials, just be, just to be very clear about it? Um, I think you could do a better job of that. <laughs> I, do. well, I, don't want, I don't want to steal your thunder, but. No, no, no. Um, no, because you sent me those, I mean, you sent me so much information, but I do know that compared to basalt, compared to fiberglass and all those, and carbon fiber, jute is jute, jute's not even close, obviously. But for the purposes of a surfboard, it is more than strong enough. And I can say that the boards that I've ridden that have just jute, I have had zero issues, none whatsoever, ever. Good. Right, so part of the question, and I guess what a lot of you as engineers would ask is, you know, if you're going to replace fiberglass on the surface of a particular surfboard, is the jute, is the natural fiber strong enough to, to hold? And um, maybe many of you students don't actually know this, but Ken and I have worked together to actually calculate the strength, the stiffness, et cetera, of the composite that he's making, which is the surface of the board. And, you know, through some of the testing that we've done, it's my professional opinion, 
that you can have a strong enough surfboard with jute to get you the feel and the strength and the stiffness that you need in your particular ride. So we've gone through that, um, the testing, we've made samples and tested them on an Instron, pulled in tension, et cetera, all that information. And so um, kind of the artistry of what Ken does a little bit with some engineering on the side, even though I haven't really included a lot of slides on that. But OK, keep going, Ken. I know. Thanks. Yeah, so that so this board was my second to last board, and so the whole thing again was to see if I I could make a board that you know was all jute and all hemp, and you know there's no metals, there's no plastics, and this one, which you'll see at the very end, turned out quite well, hmm. and I don't doubt that it will perform comparably. Yeah. Um, and you know the other thing too that I'm trying to do is at least push someone and others to say what can be done. Yeah. So with surfing, for instance, I think it was Clark phone back in the 1950s, change surfing, because before that was all hollow surfboards or wood surfboards. And then Clark phone came up with this amazing thing of let's use this phone that's everywhere and make surfboards. Genius, it's fantastic, it's easy to work with, and I actually love foam. But surfing has become so reliant on that that there's not even a consideration of anything different. It's like someone saying, you know, gasoline works well for cars. Let's not even consider anything else but that. And that's yeah. and that's why we are where we are today. Yeah. And I so, think that's a really nice analogy there that you make actually. Yeah. So anyone that can say, um, what if you did it out of jute or leaves? Someone else that has the wherewithal and really the resources can say, you know what, I saw this being done there. What else what else can be done with this? Mm -hmm. And in some respects, you know, this is my little splash into that discussion to say, well, what else can be done? Right. And the other thing I've learned, too, is um, there's an interest in this, you know, to have one psychologist in Wisconsin make a handful of boards wrapped in coffee bags and then to have that story get picked up nationally. I mean, honestly, they're great, but they're not that great that the <laughs> nation should be responding so humbly, I, I say it's less about that and more about people are clamoring yeah. for these types of ideas. People are yeah. clamoring for some sense of, yeah, the climate's going to hell in a handbasket, but what else can we do? Mm -hmm. So it's more about just the idea of what could potentially be done. Cool. Okay, let's keep moving. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a fin. Uh, again, made with jute and just some wood. And what I've done with a couple of fins, I made one uh, that's I think 18 layers of um, jute from coffee bags that's just compressed down and shaped. Again, just to show that it can be done because all fins that I can recall are made of fiberglass, mm -hmm. which are beautiful fins, don't get me wrong, but they can also be made of other things too. And the cost is much easier. Um, because Collectivo just gives them to me. Yeah, it's free. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, surfboards, back to surfboard design. Um, there's what's called a nose block and a tail block. Uh, those were originally made when people made surfboards out, out of foam because they realized that when they stood the surfboard up or when they hit somebody or hit another board rather, it would cause a ding pretty easily. So people began putting, you know, blocks of foam I mean, blocks of wood or resin on the nose and on the tail. And it's become kind of a staple for me as a way to say, you know, this is a decorative piece, but also it's kind of a trademark for me. So these, this is basically, if you look in the upper left, those are um, shards of resin. So when I'm done glassing, what I'll do is I'll pour the resin in a yogurt cup, let's say, mix in other colors, throw in wood scraps, whatever it might be. And then when you, when that cures, you can just, you know, throw it in there like that and polish it up a bit. But I also think too that, again, it just shows that that's a board that I think um, captures how good it feels to surf. And this is the board I mentioned earlier though, that is entirely jute. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so then uh, once it's cured, you gotta sand it down. And that's the part that I've not yet perfected yet. Um, it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of layers of sandpaper grits and everything <laughs> to really, really perfect it down to where it has that perfect sheen and gloss. 
Um, and yeah, I'm, I am really good with the whole rough sanding. It's that fine, you know, the last three hours or four hours that is really where the artistry kind of comes in. And that's the finished product. So you'll see on the bottom on the on the right, an obvious shout out to uh, the leaf aspect of it. Um, and uh, that fin uh, is attached with hemp, hemp strands. So when you attach a fin, you use what's called uh, fiberglass roving, which is really fine, fine uh, fiberglass strands. And when you, uh, so when you wet it, it kind of comes out perfectly smooth. With that, I used, uh, all I had access to was uh, some hemp string. So it looks kind of crude, but um, the function is really nice and it kind of has a really nice aesthetic to it. And then on the left is the finished board as well. Very cool. Oh, thanks. I threw this one in for you, Ken. Oh yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I have to just take one second here and say that Ken is a little bit uh, crazy. So he, uh, you went out in, when's the last time you've been surfing, Ken? Um, oh, geez, when was like three days ago. I three think. days ago. Yeah. Three days ago he went surfing. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like on, on Lake Michigan waters. That, that to me is just like exemplifies the passion that this crazy individual has for, I, for surfing. But I'm going to assume that of the 112 people that are on this call, at least one of them has contemplated it or has actually done it. Because, you know, when I moved away 20 years ago from here um, and moved to L.A. or so, um, there was probably 20, 30 of us or so. Mm -hmm. And now, as you've probably seen on the lake, it's there's times where it's almost too crowded. Yeah. Too crowded by Great Lake standard. By your and standards. Some folks get upset about that. They get kind of pissed off. But, you know, you, you, know, you can't hide such a good thing. Mm -hmm. And um, it is truly addictive in a great, great way. And I'm really glad to see that there is an interest in this. So on that day in Halloween, that's up in port. And I have to say it was an absolutely perfect day. It was snowing. There was an eight second period between waves. It was beyond perfect. And I was the only one. Three weeks ago at that same spot, it was a, just the same type of a day. There was like 25 people out there. Like, <laughs> so, you know. I like how it. a perfect day for you is it's snowing and I'm on the water. <laughs> <laughs> well, more perfect is shorts. Yeah. All right, but this will do. This, yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> So yeah, those are some more of the boards that I've made. And what's on the right um, is something I did for the last board that I made. So when I talked about the stringer, when you have to refine that stringer, you have to plane down. And when you pull that planer down, you get these you know curly cues of wood. And there's they're everywhere in my shop. So the thought was, how can those be repurposed? And what you have is a fin that I shaped and I'm going to assume that it's just as strong because of the curly Q dynamic of that. But aesthetically, it's uh, it's pretty unique to say the least. Yeah, it's very very cool looking. And have made some other boards. Do you want to talk uh, particularly about this black one here? Yeah, that is a board that only uses basalt, and I stumbled different, upon basalt. Yeah, Go it's ahead, a different please. type of natural fiber. Yeah, from what I understand, and you probably know this better, um, it's made out of volcanic rock or it's processed volcanic rock or something, yeah? I have never seen it in fiber form until I met you, but I knew basalt as a rock before I knew it as a fiber. Yeah, and what's amazing with that is um, since I made that board, I made one more board with that, and it might be my go-to fabric mm -hmm. because it's incredibly strong and it's incredibly light. I mean, yes, the resin makes it heavier, but you don't need as much to make it stronger. So the last board that I did was all basalt and um, it's extremely light and extremely mm -hmm. strong. And I've been surfing on that now for about two months. And just, it gives this holographic look because by that, I mean, you have, you see the weave, but then you lay another layer on top of that weave and another layer on top of that. So it's not clear like fiberglass. So you can, no matter what angle you're at, it has a different look. So if mm -hmm. I were to tilt that board around, it would look, different it yeah. would have that same solid color 
And I posted one picture of my last board, and someone thought it was a mahogany board for some reason. He thought it was wood beneath it. I was like, no, because it <laughs> looks like a grain. Uh -huh. really yeah, I've seen that board up close in, in person. It's, it's pretty trippy. It's pretty cool. No, thank you. Yeah. OK. So future pursuits, yeah. So if you go back to the slide a while ago, you saw that massive slab of foam, right? So um, yeah, exactly. So that. So yeah, this guy's putting coffee bags on top of surfboards and you know repurposed fence, and that's a step in the right direction, but it's not enough. So my grand vision, and I've shared this with uh, Dr. Sevier and Hart, is to find a way to do without the foam, completely get away, just get, just move away from the foam entirely. Also, um, not rely on wood because wood is a limited resource too. So one not so fun fact is koa, which is a tree in Hawaii. One of the reasons why there's so few koa is because it was over harvested. And you will not find a surfboard made of koa because right now to find a koa tree that's wide enough or big enough to make a 10 foot board, you're not gonna. And if you do, it's cost prohibitive, right? Mm -hmm. They over harvested koa. So the thought is what is a resource that, that could be used that is truly sustainable? And that's where you know the juke comes in. So basically the concept is how can we make a board made up of just leaves, full stop. And um, thankfully, I think that's something that we are making very slow inroads to doing. And uh, hopefully we'll have maybe another seminar in about a year or so to kind of show what we've come <laughs> up with. <laughs> but uh, that's where things are at. And I'm, I'm actually cautiously optimistic that, you know, this is something that is feasible and actually quite, quite, quite possible. Excellent. Awesome. Okay, um, I think maybe we go into a little bit of Q&A at this point. So I'll stop sharing my screen and kind of bring you in here in the spotlight. Ah, Ken, the spotlight is on you. Awesome. Bring it. <laughs> um, so we do have a, one from the audience quickly, and I think maybe this is more geared towards uh, me. But here we have a question that says, is the matrix providing most of the strength then with the, the jute fabric? And so the matrix, he means like the resin component um, compared to the jute. And I'll, I guess I can answer this, David. Uh, when we did the tests, we found that the stiffness of the jute was, you know, about 7 to 10 uh, gigapascals is the stiffness. And you can compare that with glass, which has a stiffness roughly of 70 GPA. So the jute is providing some, but not nearly as much as you would maybe get from a glass. And most epoxy resins have a stiffness of about 2 GPA. So the jute is still, you know, five times stronger than, stiffer than um, the epoxy, but not nearly as stiff generally as the glass. So um, the question that I would ask to, to Ken, who's actually ridden the board, is how does the feel of the jute fabric surfboard compare to one made out of like glass fiber? And is that something that might prohibit some surfers from stepping on your board? I don't think so, because um, the boards I'm making are not those like six foot wide boards that, like a Kelly Slater or John John Florence, these professionals would would ride. Mm -hmm. Most of my boards are nine to ten feet long, and you want some girth to them. Yeah, I will say that um, I've ridden some boards, like long boards, before, where when you you know when you're surfing, you do want a, maybe a smidge of flex, but you there. But there's also like a hollow, tingy feel to it, which is what all boards have sometimes. I think mine be, and maybe it's because of the jute, and also they're thicker. They're a bit more solid. They're like an old school board. Mm -hmm. So, but performance wise, again, I've seen other folks that surf better than me surf my board and they're doing the exact same maneuvers on it. And not one person has, has said, this feels too funny. I can't ride that again. I mean, there's, there's no difference in my eyes. Yeah. So generally you can, you can more or less match the feel. Um, yeah. The question then, uh, another question I would have is, how did you, how did you determine like how much material to use, like how many layers of fabric to use, how much, um, you know, was it just uh, by feel? I mean, you don't have a lot of engineering training by background. I mean, it's no. more of like an artist than idea. So, how did you know how much to use and it, whether or not it would be strong enough and etc. There is no, I mean, there's an endless number of forums online 
and Facebook groups and websites about how to make a board. I mean, this is something that I had no idea that a lot of folks were you know, doing this. So the amount of advice that that's out there is endless. So the standard, I think, is six ounce on the bottom or four ounce on the bottom glass and then two sixes on the top or mm -hmm. six and a four on the top. So um, that, that refers to the for oh the weight folks of, out there. Yeah, that refers to the what's known as the aerial density of the fabric. That is how much it weighs per square inch, approximately. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you want more density or more layers on top because that's where your feet are going. So when you pop up, there's more weight applied to that. Mm -hmm. On the bottom, you don't need as much because it's just water. So uh, I've read where some. I, like the um, the jute is roughly eight to ten ounce, right? So I figured, well, eight to ten, add another six on top of that. That's more than enough. <laughs> you know, I kind of ballparked it. Sure. And you know, like I said earlier, uh, my first board, I went overboard and it was way, way too heavy. It's never going to snap. It's never going to ding. So over time, you know, you figure it out. So mm -hmm. I think right now, what I've done with that last green board, it had four ounce basalt on the bottom and then one layer of raw jute and that's plenty strong enough and on the bottom it's just one layer of jute because they want to stay away from all fiberglass with that basalt board i think that's four ounce basalt with four ounce glass on the bottom and then two layers of four ounce on the top with a four ounce glass on top so that's in essence eight on the bottom 12 on the top and again yeah. plenty strong enough yeah sure have any of your boards ever failed? Just curious. I don't, I don't know. I've not had a delamination yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> that happens over time if you leave out in the sun, you know, all that. Uh, I, I let a friend of mine take one out, and we're walking up at water, and I heard this, bam, and <laughs> dropped it. And I, I like, smiled, but I was really panicked, and nothing happened. Uh -huh. you know, I mean, there was, there was, like, a scratch on the resin, of course. But um, I've yet to have a DLAM. I've yet to have a crack. I've yet, I mean, they haven't failed yet. Yeah. So, I mean, That's they will awesome. eventually cool. if you drop a hammer on it, but for normal wear and tear, they're completely fine. Uh -huh. We have a question here in the chat from one of the students that's asking a little bit more about the collaboration that you have with um, some of the professors here. Mm -hmm. You want to just elaborate on some of the things that we've done together? Yeah, so um, I think the first time you stopped by the bay, I, I think that was just to kind of give you a, a glimpse into what I was working on, and your feedback was extremely helpful. Um, but but again, I just had this idea of um, how could we uh, create a composite material that could, in essence, kind of be strong enough to build a board out of. And um, thankfully, we had access to some of the resources you have, and a lot of what I've done has been by gut, by touch and feel, but I've never been able to actually test the strength of things. Right. And um, I think was it I think it was you that was even kind of saying some more crude ways of testing the strength of this composite. So right. for me to kind of be in my shop and kind of bend something or put something on a vice is one thing, but this have this device that you all use to actually measure it and mm -hmm. know the point of failure. Um, has really proven beneficial to kind of say, well, let's continue. And, and I'll just share, you know, like with you, that if nothing else, this relationship has helped me realize the value of continuing. Yeah. You know. I, I think it's an important testament is that like different people have different skill sets, right? You know, I would, I have a lot of background and in, in information on composite materials and I've worked with a lot of composite materials in the past, but no way would I on my own have ever th thought to fabricate a surfboard out of natural materials and, and go about that route, right? Um, and, you know, Ken has got this fiery passion for surfing and is a very good craftsman and knows how to make these things, but maybe is lacking a little bit in the analytical side of how much material do I need? What thickness do I need? How can I improve my manufacturing technique? All those sorts of things, right? And so when you're going and when working on a design, whether it's eco-friendly design or whatever design, you have to learn sometimes that other people have information that you do not have. 
and you can leverage other people to help you with your design in areas that that you're not particularly strong. And you know, this is one example of that, but as mechanical engineers, when you go out into the future, you're gonna have to work with electrical engineers and <clears throat> you don't wanna design a whole circuit board from scratch yourself with your particular mechanical engineering background. You need to lean on some of those electrical engineers and computer engineers and et cetera. And I think this is a, a, a microcosm example of that is Ken has a particular skill set and he went out and was seeking information about a little bit more engineering and a little bit more analytics and you know here we are and we we helped him to do that um maybe i could just pop in for a quick second on on some of the stuff that we did to answer the student's question a little bit more clearly um i have this you know testing that we did with ken where we created basically composite material samples where here these are jute materials and they have end tabs made of aluminum on either end and we put these into an instrument so a lot of material and information here but Basically, we manufactured them to size and we put them in an instron and we pulled on them. And this gave us strength and stiffness of the particular materials and that allowed us to make a better judgment of how this compared to fiberglass and how much material he might need to match the strength and the stiffness of fiberglass. So, you know, here we are with low displacement curves and all the engineering side that, you know, maybe Ken is not familiar with the ins and outs with, but at the end when I make a recommendation and say something like, you need about three times the amount of jute for every amount of fiberglass that you have, that's something that he can understand, right? So um, I make recommendations here based on the information that we did and, and that was sort of the collaboration that we had together. Um, between between Ken and I. So that's that. And we see we had a um, guest appearance by Dr. Severe as well, and who's been very <laughs> beneficial and very helpful throughout this process as well. Right, and, and Dr. Severe has been working with Ken to actually make a computer model and an FEA simulation of the loads on the board and some of the internal structure that might be required to replace the foam if we wanted to go that particular route. So. He's been pretty uh, fundamental in, in helping Ken in that way as well. Okay, we're, we're kind of nearing time here. It's 1046. We got to be out by 1050. Uh, so I'll just give you the floor one last time and just say, is there anything else you want to add or talk about that we haven't had a chance to discuss yet? No, no, I think on the last summer, you, you said is spot on, and that is the importance of building relationships outside of the classroom, um, trusting in the dialogue at a coffee shop or the chat on the beach and kind of remaining open and really receptive to not knowing when you might kind of help someone solve a problem, but also need the support of someone to help you solve a problem. And uh, I think we've been doing this now for about a year and a half or two years. And I think the way you summed it up is spot on. And I think that's why we're here today. So thanks and uh, greatly appreciate it. And glad there's some interest in this. Yeah, we appreciate it too. Um... Really nice to, to see some local eco-friendly designs. It's pretty pretty awesome to think about. So uh, we have one more question here quick. Maybe we can sneak it in. What are some of the ways Dr. Hart and Severe communicated info to you that stuck? Like what language was used that helped you sort of understand things? Um, what language was, was used? Um, well, like you all know, I'm, I, I'm not trained. So I would basically ask point blank, I'm humble enough to say, could you break it down in terms that I would understand? <laughs> I've, I've got my doctorate, I'm competent enough to figure things out, but um, you know, I'm fine with saying I don't get it. Yeah. And I think over time um, I've begun to catch on and, and that's helped me kind of propose a few ideas that have fed off of the knowledge that I've gotten from like both of them. So to that end, do not hesitate to ask questions. Yeah. Agreed. Okay, well, I think that'll do it. Um, Ken, I really appreciate you coming in. I really appreciate the stories, the pictures, and awesome. Students, follow him on Instagram. I'm telling you, he's got awesome awesome pictures. I love seeing them when they pop up. They're really cool. Even if it's him on a surfboard in, like, the middle of January, <laughs> which, I'm, which I'm sure are coming soon. So, uh, okay, thanks a lot, Ken, and students. Um, we'll see you for the next seminar. Bye-bye. Right. Take care.